Hey everybody, welcome back to the Frugal Filmmaker Q&A. That's the show where you send me a question and I try to sound intelligent. If you'd like your question read on the show, please send me an email at thefrugalfilmmaker at gmail.com. That's the best chance you have of getting your question read on the show. You can also leave a comment below or you can send me a message on Twitter at Frugal Filmmaker. My video last week was a review of the LG G4 smartphone. It was a new smartphone by LG. They contacted me, asked me if I might want to review it. I said, sure. I was kind of curious about the filmmaking elements about it, the camera, for example, see how well it performed. And if you want to see my full review of it or the modest review of the actual filmmaking parts, the camera and the sound, you can go ahead and check that review out. My first couple Q&A questions actually come from the comments on that video. And the first one comes from Bo Wright, who says, I'm not sure why the built-in app lacking manual controls was that big of a deal to you. You can install plenty of free apps like Open Camera to get manual video controls. You know, Bo's right. I did make a big deal about the fact that the video controls on the G4 were weak compared to the still camera controls, which were awesome. I didn't understand why those still camera controls were not available in video mode. And the fact that LG makes you go out and search the Google Play Store to find an application that's going to work on your phone to give you those manual controls is a bunch of baloney, in my opinion. I think that those controls should be there available anyway. And uh, for anybody that's going to say, well, it's the same kind of thing with Filmic Pro on the iPhone, I tend to disagree because Apple will make you jump through a thousand hoops before you can put any kind of application on, on iTunes for download because they have to make sure that it's going to work on their phones. Now, there's no such stringent requirements on the Google Play Store. Anybody can upload something and make it available. And because there are so many different Android phones, of course, not everything is going to work, which is why I don't understand why LG wouldn't just give you an application on your phone that will just work. And it will give you the same manual controls, which are obviously there and available in still camera mode. And you'd think it'd be an easy port. I'm not a programmer, so I don't know. But I, that was disappointing for me. And I didn't make a big deal about it because I didn't think I should waste my time looking for something that would work. And I did even find other applications and test them and even paid for some that wouldn't work. So it was, it was a bummer. And I was disappointed in that. Another follow-up question to that video was from I'm the Dave Man, who says, what phone or even tablet would you suggest a person to use for video with better recording control and battery life? I'm not a smartphone or tablet expert, and I'd be more than willing to hear from anybody out there that wants to comment below about the best smartphone or best tablet available for video recording. I mean, I really don't want to record video on a smartphone. As I mentioned in the video, it's just in emergency situations or when I'm traveling, so I don't have to lug my camera gear around, although my camera is pretty small. Maybe I should just take it anyway, because it seems to do a decent job. Um, but if anybody else out there wants to comment, I understand, you know, the iPhone 6, Samsung Galaxy 6 seems to be the main competitors between the uh, Apple and Android market as far as video quality goes. So if anybody wants to chime in and, you know, let us know, that would be great. Turning to email, we have a question from iGoPro Everything, who says, do you ever use the Zoom function in your editing software? If you don't know, the editing software I use is Sony Vegas Pro 12. That's what I'm using right now. And uh, I believe he, I'm the Dave Man is referring to the digital zoom feature, which allows you to actually zoom in on the frame. And I tend to use that all the time. I tend to use more cuts, you know, cutting to a closer shot, especially when I'm doing on-screen computer instructional videos, that kind of thing. Whenever I'm using some software and you see me using a screen recorder, I will definitely cut all over the place uh, to accent whatever area of the screen I want people to look at. So I do cut in there. And as far as zooming in, uh, like the Ken Burns effect, I actually made a video about that. It's really easy in Sony Vegas Pro, and it's probably easy on every other editor as well. It's very common. But yes, I do use it. It does draw your attention like a camera zoom. It tells you where to look. Probably my favorite use of the zoom feature was when I was doing a web series called Midnight. And it was a handheld shot, and I was moving around the lobby of this uh, building. And the boom kept dipping in. It was an extended take, so I really couldn't cut away to anything. But using that zoom feature was really nice because I could zoom in on the frame, and it was so subtle. I didn't have to zoom in that much to lose the boom, but because it was a handheld shot, the zoom was completely concealed, and so that was really handy for that kind of a thing. Okay, another email is from Robert Gomes, who says, I've got a Dell monitor in a closet and was thinking of selling it, but then I thought I remembered seeing something about how it's good when you finally start editing to have two monitors. Is this monitor something I will need eventually? Well, this is completely optional. I mean, I edit everything on a laptop, so I don't have a separate monitor. However, if I had the opportunity, would I get one? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that's really nice about having an external monitor is you can use it for two things. Well, actually, it's the same thing, basically, but any editor will have windows, docking windows that you can remove and slide over into the other monitor, which is really great because now you don't have to compete for screen real estate on your main monitor. Say you could just use the main monitor for your timeline and an external monitor for other windows, such as effects and your waveform and your audio meters and all that stuff you could park over on another monitor while you save your main monitor for timeline stuff. 
Uh, another good use for it is to make that external monitor itself a, a big preview window so you can see your video and see what it's going to look like. And because the image is bigger, you can notice mistakes and things you're going to have to fix, color issues, all that stuff. It's great to have a separate monitor. You can actually see, just for me telling you this, you could actually have multiple monitors, more than just two, but have two or three that will allow you to separate everything and give you just more freedom of screen real estate. It just makes your workflow that much better. Uh, and in fact, some people are using 4K monitors for this very purpose because even though you have really nothing to play on a 4K monitor, because it's so huge resolution-wise, you can put all kinds of windows on that 4K monitor because you just have that much more space to play with. Our last question comes from Rick Allberg, who says, I'll be directing a lot on location, single cam, and studio, multicam, interview segments this summer, and was wondering if you've come across any inexpensive and unobtrusive wireless in-ear IFB systems. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what an IFB is, it's that little earpiece you see news anchors wearing. That's probably the most common place you'll see it. It's almost invisible because the wire tends to be clear or transparent and the earpiece sits in their ear. And the purpose of that is for the producer to talk to the news anchor to feed them information basically or give them cues or anything that the producer wants to tell them. So if you're dealing with on-air talent or live, you definitely want an IFB if you want to be able to talk to them. The stage manager can only do so much with hand signals. Rick in his email mentioned he tried to use a cell phone, but the cell phone would interfere with the audio. That is a problem, so you can't use that. My first thought was, why not use some kind of walkie-talkie with a headset setup so you could just have an earpiece. And granted, he says in an obtrusive, so those earpieces tend to be black. If your talent has long hair, you could conceal it under the hair, or maybe you could uh, get a custom earpiece and just rewire it to work with the walkie-talkies. But I found a set on Amazon for about 40 bucks, uh, and that should solve your problems. You have great range with that, and you'll be able to talk them directly into their ear. Of course, they have a volume control, and it would work essentially as an IFB. It's the same basic, same basic idea, uh, only it's wireless. Unlike you know, most news anchors have hard lines uh, going back to the control room. So there's that. If anybody else has any ideas about how to make an IFB system, an inexpensive IFB system, please comment below. If you're wondering what IFB stands for, I believe it's interruptible foldback, and that's what it is. So hopefully that helps, Rick. Good luck. All right, so that's all our questions for today's Frugal Filmmaker Q&A. Remember, if you'd like your question read on the show, please send me an email to frugalfilmmaker at gmail.com. You can also comment below. I might pull it from there. Or you can leave me a message on Twitter at Frugal Filmmaker. Hopefully I'll have another video this Thursday and then another Q&A on Monday. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you then.